right, I think we're gonna get started since we're right at two o'clock now. Um, so thank you to everybody who is joining us here today. Um, my name is Kimberly Gerling. I'm the Interim Executive Director of Evidence for Democracy. Um, so for those of you um, who are new, um, we are a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization. We're based here in Ottawa and our mandate is to promote the transparent use of evidence in government decision making. So we do that through issue-based campaigns. We do work on um, education and training for scientists and the science community as well as the public. And then we also work on research relating to evidence-informed decision making. So today I'm really excited because we're going to be talking about science advice. So if you've been following along with our work in the last couple of months, you may have seen our latest campaign, um, which is all about safeguarding science advice in Canada. And the reason we were doing this campaign was to protect and advance the role of Canada's chief science advisor. Um, but we figured that, you know, while we were putting this campaign out there, while a lot of our community is very familiar with science advice in Canada and how it came to be and the past, the present, the future of science advice here in Canada, not everyone is. And so we thought that this would be a good opportunity today to talk a little bit about what science advice actually looks like in Canada, what the role of the chief science advisor is, why we have a chief science advisor, and talk a little bit about the history of science advice in Canada, as well as sort of speculate a bit on what the future of science advice could look like, um, especially with up and coming challenges like the climate crisis and COVID-19. So I'm really excited today to meet with you all. Um, just a few housekeeping notes that I, I wanted to mention as well. Um, I can see that we have um, a number of attendees, all of you are muted right now, um, but we can use the chat function here. I see a couple of you are already um, chat functioning right now. Um, also, Emma popped into the chat box that um, if you want, we have a captioning function. We're still trying to figure out whether this is gonna work. The last time we did a webinar, it didn't work great. Um, so you should be able to see um, in, in Chrome, if you're working in Chrome, a caption to open the link and then get captioning on Zoom as well. So my apologies if it doesn't work perfectly, we're still trying to figure it out, but hopefully that works as well. Um, and we are gonna be doing Q&A after the panel today. So, um, you know, feel free to drop questions and answer or questions into the chat box as well. Emma is gonna be on the call as well and she'll be monitoring it. So thanks so much for joining us. So let's get into it. So what does a chief science advisor do and why, why would we want one? So science advice has been around for a long time and science advisors exist um, across the country, or sorry, across multiple countries around the world and they can play a number of different roles. So this is just a, an example of a couple of different national science advisors that exist in other countries. Up here in the UK, we've got a science advisor in New Zealand up here on the right, one in Ireland, one in, in um, India. So uh, many countries have federal science advisors. They can play various different roles. And while there are a number of people who are working inside the government, people like scientists and decision makers, um, they're conducting science advice and might provide policy advice. The idea of having a science advisor is often to provide nonpartisan external advice to government decision makers. Science advisors might do things like provide advice. They might conduct reports. Um, and most of the time they're not actually decision making bodies, but they usually act to support decision makers in government. Oops, so why would we want a science advisor? Um, so they can play a lot of different roles in government. Um, and there's a lot of benefits to having someone like an external science advisor in the government. So one of the reasons is that not a lot of decision makers have training in science and not a lot of time do we expect them to. So I put a little link here to a great op-ed piece written by Vanessa and Molly Sung that came out last year that did an analysis of um, MPs in Canada and showed that not very many people actually have STEM backgrounds or science backgrounds who are actually working in political decision making. And while, you know, it's not a requirement, they're not required to, it can make it really challenging sometimes to find and use evidence. And so the idea of having an external science advisor can be a really beneficial tool um, to help support decision makers in being able to find and access science um, in, their, in the work that they're doing. We also know, and we've seen this in our work at, at Evidence for Democracy, that evidence-based decision making is actually really hard in practice. You know, sometimes the, the evidence can be really conflicting, sometimes science is developing really quickly. Um, sometimes it's just, you know, hard to access and find science or, or know where to look to find evidence. So science advisors can help with that process as well. 
Um, like I mentioned before, oftentimes they are working as a scientist. Sometimes they're employed full-time by the government. Sometimes they are still working in other places like academia or industry. And so they can act as an external nonpartisan voice to add um, sort of an, an external voice to a conversation about government decision-making. They can help find and navigate evidence, make recommendations. They can also do things like create targeted reports for decision making, which sometimes science advisors do. And overall, they really help to bridge the gap between scientists and the government, as well as sometimes between departments, um, from the government to the public, sometimes between sectors, and even sometimes internationally. So there are really a lot of reasons why a government what, might want to implement a federal science advisor to help support them in evidence-based decision making around science. So, oops, let's talk a little bit about Canada. Um, so Canada has a long and interesting history about science advice, and so I want to give you a couple of highlights um, as to sort of how science advice developed in Canada. Um, so if we're going to go back into the 1930s, the sort of first de facto science advisors would have been the presidents of the National Research Council. So the National Research Council played a really important role, especially during war times in really shaping Canada's science and technology goals and directions. And so the NRC would have had presidents, and although they weren't necessarily called a science advisor, they certainly played an important role in advising the, direct, the direction of science in Canada. So that would have been sort of earlier times, but then we move into the 1960s and it, a science secretariat was implemented in the Privy Council. So this consisted of 10 staff and their task was to help government departments and agencies in actually getting proposals to cabinet. Um, and during that time, they also conducted some studies, they put forward proposals when the government requested it. So they really did provide a bit of a science advisory function, especially when it comes to sort of putting proposals or, um, forward to, to uh, cabinet. And at the time in the 60s, a scientist, a geoscientist named Robert Uffen was appointed to be the science advisor to the science secretariat. So that would have been sort of the first more formal science advisor. Around the same time in 1966, um, the Science Council of Canada was also established, which had originally scientists and civil servants, although it later became more scientists. And this existed from uh, the 60s into the 1990s when it was later um, abolished. So then we moved from the 60s into the 70s. And around this time, the science advisor role from the science secretary was abolished because the government moved towards a ministry of science and technology. And it was at this time that the first minister of science was appointed, which is this guy here, um, Arthur Gillespie, or sorry, Alistair Gillespie, who was the first science minister of Canada. And then moving forward to 1983, um, the, uh, the the Prime Minister implemented a brand new Chief Science Advice to the federal government who was also serving as Secretary to the Ministry of Science and, and Technology. Um, and the mandate of this Science Advisor was really to um, help restructure the ministry as it was eventually moved into the Ministry of Economic Development, so it no longer became a Ministry of Science. Then, as many of you will probably know, in 2002, Prime Minister Martin appointed a brand new National Science Advisor. This was Arthur Carty. Uh, at the time, he was the president of the National Research Council. Um, and the mandate was really to make sure that Canada's investments in science were strategic and focused and really based on results. However, that role was abolished in 2008. So that was really the end of, um, of having a formal science advisor in Canada until our current advisor. Um, and it's worth mentioning that around the same time, there was a couple of other arm's length bodies that emerged to sort of support the government in providing science advice. And a couple examples of that would be um, CCA, the Council of Canadian Academies, which has, exists outside of government, but is often called upon by the government to provide um, unbiased reports. So they don't actually make recommendations, they provide reports that the government can then use to provide evidence to outstanding questions, as well as the Science, Technology, and Innovation Council, which is more internal and provides confidential information to the government. Um, and then it's also worth mentioning that although, you know, they're not necessarily science advisors in the sort of more formal sense, there are all, also a network of folks within the government that do provide scientific advice to ongoing discussions. People like chief scientists in different departments, as well as assistant deputy ministers of science technology across government departments as well. So lots and lots of sort of stories of science advice within the government. Um, sometimes we've had a government science advisor, sometimes we haven't. 
Um, we'll get to the current science advisor in a moment, but it's worth mentioning that really whether or not we've had a science advisor and what that role has looked like has really changed a lot depending on the political situation, depending on who was in power at the time, depending on what was going on in the government at any given moment. And that's, I think, an important thing to, to think about as we think about where science advice could go moving forward. So let's go, oops, sorry, let's go now to, oh my goodness, jumping all around. Sorry, guys, there we go. So now, you know, in 2008, we, we no longer had a science advice, advisor, and this is around the same time in the sort of early 2010s that Evidence for Democracy was formed. And a lot of the reason that we started doing work was because this was really kind of a dark time for science and the government. Um, as many of you know, if you've been supporting the organization for a long time, um, the Harper government really became kind of known as an anti-science government. Um, and this was exemplified by the muzzling of scientists. There was a lot of cuts to government science. This example here on the left is an actual photo of books being thrown out from departments of fisheries and oceans libraries. So it was really not a great time for science in the government. And there was a lot of, of challenges being raised by scientists in the government and scientists across Canada who were concerned about the state of science in Canada. Um, and during this time, Evidence for Democracy was formed originally because of a protest that was staged by Katie Gibbs, our executive director, um, as well as a professor at the University of Ottawa, where scientists took to the streets to really protest um, the government's lack of support for science and the muzzling of scientists in the government. So this was really a turning time, I think, for science in Canada. Um, and during the lead up to the 2015 election, Evidence for Democracy ran a campaign to try and push to make science more of a priority, to get science a really key election issue, and really spotlight scientists' frustration about the lack of science in the government. And one of the things that was really being talked about at the time was the, the fact that the science advisor had been cut and that we really needed that, not only the unmuzzling of scientists, not only more for support for science, but also science advice and support for science advice within the federal government. And so you can see with them, there was a lot of press, there was a lot of sort of publicity around the challenges for science in the government. And this really worked. Um, in the lead up to the election, science really did become a key election issue. And when the Trudeau liberals were elected, they really did run on an election campaign that was rooted in science. And a number of parties actually brought science to the spotlight um, during that election. So this is, you know, now we're in 2015. And a couple of really big changes happened at the time. So um, although there had not been a Minister of Science at the time, the government actually implemented not only um, a Minister of Innovation in Science, but an, an actual dedicated Minister of Science, as you might remember, that was Christy Duncan. Um, they implemented the, federal, the Fundamental Science Review, which provided key recommendations on how to support science in government um, and in Canada. But that also included a call for a Chief Science Advisor. And in Late 2016, Christy Duncan actually put out a public call for a national science advisor. Um, there were some consultations done with a number of key stakeholders, including us, E4D. Um, and so it was a very exciting time. We saw this sort of, you know, uprising in support for evidence-based decision making and support for science, as well as, you know, implementation of a new chief science advisor. And in 2017, Dr. Mona Niemer was appointed and in put into a brand new position of Chief, Chief Science Advisor of Canada. So this was a really exciting time. So what was the office asked to do? Um, so this is the full mandate, but um, basically the, the mandate of the office was to provide advice um, to make sure that government science was available to the public. So really addressing that unmuzzling issue and that scientists could speak freely about their work, um, providing advice to the government, in processes to make sure that science is used in the government in, in the way the government makes decisions, um, recommending ways to really improve science advice in the way that science advice is, is sort of integrated into the government, as well as you know, ways to better support evidence-based decision making. So it's a pretty broad mandate, but it was really addressing a lot of the concerns that the, the public was having around um, science in Canada. So the role was provided to directly support the prime minister, as well as the science minister, as well as build important bridges between sectors and departments. So alongside sort of addressing that mandate, the chief science advisor needed to deliver a report to the prime minister, as well as the minister of science, um, coordinate that advice to the minister of science, as well as within sort of the community of science and really work on that dialogue between federal scientists and within academia. So it was not only about sort of supporting evidence-based decision-making, but also building a more um, strategic, broader network of science across Canada. 
So this was a really exciting time for science in Canada. And I know that, you know, for someone like me at the time who had been working on trying to push for evidence-based decision-making and science advice in Canada, um, it was a really great thing. So I figured that, that what we would talk about a little bit today is, so since then, what has actually happened in the last three years? So what did the office do? So I'm going to talk through a couple of, the, of some of the key examples of what the science advisor has actually done in the, in the mandate so far. So one of the big ones was really trying to take steps towards the unmuzzling of federal scientists. And one of the ways that they tried to do this is through the Canadian model scientific integrity policy. So this was really based on a memorandum of agreement that was set up between the public service union that supports the scientists that are working in the federal public service, as well as the treasury board. And this was really to set up a policy that would allow scientists to speak more freely about their work to the public, but, but also to ensure that, that things like scientists can have enough training, that they're credited for their work within government departments, and just really building uh, an actual policy of science integrity within the government. So the Office of the Chief Science Advisor was responsible for creating the, the draft of that policy, which was then um, implemented in 20. I think it was 2018, sorry, that's my, my fault here. Um, and it was meant to apply to all science-based departments and agencies. So since then, the policy has now been released and I believe that all, pol all science-based departments and agencies should have this policy in place now. Um, and now the next step is really just making sure that this policy is being implemented and actually you know, doing what it's supposed to do. So this was one of the sort of big things that the office did when it was implemented um, really at the very beginning, which was pretty exciting. Um, another thing that the office has done and, and I guess continues to do is convening expert panels. So the one example that um, is sort of the big one that the office did was this um, panel on aquaculture science that was really meant to provide advice and recommendations on the appropriate use of science in risk-based aquaculture decision-making. So the Chief Science Advisor's Office um, assembled a panel of experts that put together this report and recommendations to the Department of Fisheries and Oceans, um, and then worked with the department on making those recommendations to, to Canadians. So you can find the report online if that's of interest as well. Um, like I mentioned, the office did a lot of science promotion and outreach and diplomacy. So you can see in these photos here, um, especially in the first year or two, the, the chief science advisor did a lot of traveling and a lot of interacting with other countries. So you can see on the right here, she is meeting with the chief science advisor of New Zealand, um, building really strong networks of science advice around the country, speaking on panels, you know, interacting with members of the public. So taking um, her role as that sort of public facing role for science in the government and interacting with a strong external network of science advice was a real, um, I think a key part of, of what she's been up to as well. And then just before the pandemic in February, the office released a new roadmap on open science. So the government of Canada has a number of commitments around open government. So making sure that government is open to the public, um, and trying to increase transparency um, in the government. And open science is one of the key facts, facets of open government. So just before the pandemic started, the, the office put out this brand new roadmap. So it's fairly high level at this point. Um, and because of the pandemic, not a lot of steps have really been taken on the roadmap yet, but it sets out a plan for how the government can begin moving towards open science in Canada. Um, so it's kind of too bad that it came out right before everything changed a lot, but I mean, it's a really good first step towards making science more open and accessible to Canadians. Um, and then also back in, I think it was February as well, um, there was also a youth council set up. Um, so this, these are young um, scientists from all different disciplines who are all working all across Canada. Um, and they've been convened by the chief science advisor to um, provide her with a youth perspective and advice on the work that the office is doing. Um, so they can work on a number of different questions. I know they're doing a lot of work around COVID right now, um, identifying key issues and really bringing that youth voice to science advice in Canada, which I thought was a really interesting kind of perspective that the office could take. Um, since 
in the last year or two, there's also been some movement around departmental science advisors. So this is actually something that I've been quite interested in and passionate about for a long time. Um, but we've only seen a few happening. These are an example of a few of them. Um, so now the government chief science advisor has a number of departmental science advisors who are science advisors that are housed within individual departments or agencies. Generally, they have scientific expertise that pertains to that individual department or agency. So for example, these are a couple of them. So um, if you were lucky enough to come to our COVID-19 science panel, um, you would have seen Sarah and Kara come and chat. So Kara is a, a physician working at Health Canada. Sarah is a, a aerospace astrophysics. I'd have to go back and check, but she's working at space. Um, so, I mean, it's a really cool way to see science advice being brought to the departments, and then they also meet on a pretty regular basis through a network of departmental science advisors to help support the chief science advisor in sort of bridging into the departments and working on broad science issues. So then COVID happened, and obviously this was a really clear example of where science advice could come into play quite clearly. And I was pretty happy to see this, the office take some really interesting steps in support of science advice in the face of COVID-19. Um, so, I mean, we had a panel on some of the ways that the office was doing this, which is, you can go back and check it out if you, if you missed it. But a couple of examples are um, the chief science advisor sits on and chairs a number of different expert panels and task forces that are right now working to advise the government um, and provide sort of a collaboration and and link between the science community and the government. So each of the task forces or expert panels works on a different sort of facet of COVID-19. So for example, the immunity task force is working on vaccine development. Um, there's clinical ones. So there's a number of different ones, a, a large number actually, and the, the science advisor is involved in many of them. Um, the office has also been really helping to coordinate CanCOVID, which is a digital platform using Slack, where scientists across Canada are communicating to share ongoing and updated research around COVID-19 to try and help with that collaboration and communication of science during a really challenging time, which I think is a really innovative way of sort of bringing open science into practice. And I'm really curious to see how that's going to change science communication moving forward. Um, the office also in March put out an open call um, to public to publishers to try and increase open access for COVID-19 publications. So, I mean, leaning into that open science rule that they've been really working on, um, I can, I'm not surprised to see that this was an angle that they took as well. So, that was a really big overview of some of the steps that the office has taken in the last three years. But um, when the rule was implemented in 2017, it was pretty clearly stated that, you know, it was a three-year term and the mandate was also a three-year mandate. So, you know, it wasn't legislated in legislation. It was a position that was put into place. And the official end date of the chief science advisor actually ended last week. So this is why we started a campaign, which I'll get to in a second. But I will note that, you know, the, the end of the mandate doesn't mean that we expected the office to just disappear. It's obviously it's still there. If you go to the website, it's still there. Um, but, but what happens now? Um, and why, why does this matter? So, I mean, so far what it looks like from my point of view, and we, I mean, there still could be announcements to come. I'm expecting that the office is gonna continue functioning. It's been clear that the government has, has put an emphasis on the importance of this, this office. But we wanted to run a campaign because from our point of view at Evidence for Democracy, we think that this is time that we should really be not just sort of maintaining the status quo when it comes to science advice, but really thinking about the next steps. So this is why we started the campaign that we did. So some of you may have participated in this campaign um, or looked at it or read our emails about it. But what, basically what we wanted to do was in the lead up to sort of the end of the chief science advisor's mandate, we were a little bit worried. You know, why haven't we heard anything about what's happening to this office? Um, I'm happy to see that the office is still functioning, which is great. But what we wanted to see out of the campaign was not only to sort of make the mandate continue, but update and expand the mandate to address upcoming challenges, to make sure that the office is equipped with you know, real tangible goals to address not only COVID-19, but up and coming challenges of the future. Um, in order to make an expanded mandate, in order to be uh, able to achieve that, we thought that you know, they would need money to make sure that they could add staff. So we asked for $2 million to achieve this upcoming updated mandate. 
And then we also asked for the role of the chief science advisor to be legislated, to be enshrined in legislation. And basically what that would mean is that instead of having a position that could potentially be cut, the role would be protected so that even if there was a change in government um, or you know, a challenging financial situation, there would be a necessity to actually keep the role. Um, yeah, and so why, why did we think that that's important? So I mean, I, I went through a couple of these already, but really a lot has changed since the original mandate has been put into place. So, I mean, as we looked at earlier, the original mandate had a lot of language about doing things like, you know, exploring new ways to increase um, science advice in government. So I would say the departmental science advisors are a really good step towards that. You know, making sure that scientists can speak about their work was in there, which, I mean, I think the, the scientific integrity policies are also really great. Um, and even though there's lots that still needs to be done there, I think that the language of the mandate needs to update with the new challenges that the office is facing. There was also a, an election in 2019, and we no longer have a dedicated minister of science. And while we were really happy to see that the chief science advisor's um, role was, was outlined in a number of ministerial mandate letters, like the innovation science and industry minister, I think that you know it's really shown that there, there needs to be a, an updated role to account for the fact that we no longer have a dedicated minister of science. We also have a minority government now, which means that an election could be called at any time and without that legislation, um, the role could be cut if someone wanted to change it or if there was you know, a challenge that, that meant that the office was no longer functioning. Um, and I think that you know, we're moving into a really challenging economic time. We're moving into you know, a recovery and sort of coping with COVID for really the near and, and long-term future as well as dealing with challenges like the climate crisis. And all of these challenges require strong science. And, and I think it's really important to, to maintain and to grow the office to address these challenges. And I think that by growing that mandate, you know, we can really take full advantage of what the office can do and shape it with the, the changing future. Um, so in this letter, um, so what we did in the campaign, so we, we asked for these, these asks and we put them together into an open letter that we sent to the Prime Minister, we sent to the Finance Minister, and we went sent to the Minister of Innovation, Science, and Industry. We chose these key decision makers because we believe that collectively they have the power to make the changes that we want to see in the office. Um, so the letter was signed by over 2,000 people across Canada, which included scientists, science supporters, um, people who are interested in science advice, people who are, you know, concerned about the state of, of science advice in Canada. And while I delivered this letter to these key decision makers, we still haven't heard anything back. So even though the mandate end date has ended, we are pleased to see that the office still exists. And I mean, I'm happy that this speech from the throne that came out last week did have language around, you know, making sure that science is used. but I really still feel like I'd like to hear more around how science advice is gonna grow in the future. And I, I will continue to sort of use this open letter to engage with government decision makers um, in, the, in the coming weeks and months as well. And like I mentioned, I think that one of the key steps in this letter is really legislation. And I think that one of the reasons that this is so important is because science advice should never be you know, partisan. And, and having a science advisor just because it was implemented by the current government, which is the liberal government, doesn't mean that it should be viewed as a position that is you know, only, only relevant to the, the government in power. And especially you know, if, if the government changes or you know, moving decades into the future, we wanna send a message that science advice is critical no matter who's in power, no matter what's going on in the government. And that's why I think that legislation is such a key step with respect to science, in, science advice in government. So, we also asked in the open letter about some potential um, ways that the office could be grown. So, so these are some of the key next steps that I think science advice could actually do here in Canada. So um, for one, you know, making sure that we continue to have a science and technology lens in our recovery from COVID-19. So not just in sort of acute recovery, but looking at how we recover economically, looking at how we recover sustainably, um, ensuring that science is constantly being used in our COVID-19 recovery plan is super fundamental. And I think the CSA could have a real role there. Um, I think that having a national science strategy that engages the provinces, the territories, as well as indigenous gover governments could be a really key role of the, na of the national science advisor. Um, as I mentioned before, that diplomacy lens can be a really strong point 
of a chief science advisor. And I think that that can be really grown into actually having a national strategy because coordination is so important as we all face this collective challenge. Um, I mean, we've been talking so much lately around the challenges on equity, diversity, and inclusion. Um, and I think that a science advisor could be really important on this as well, especially on integrating things like indigenous knowledge into our policies. And I'm talking, you know, I think that the role of a science advisor is easy to think about thinking about it in sort of a hard and physical sciences kind of way. But it's important to remember that the social sciences are a really key part of this as well. Um, as I mentioned before, the office put out these, these brand new policies around scientific integrity and a roadmap for open science. But in order for those policies to work well, we need to ensure that there's adherence and that there's consistency in how they're applied and that you know, if they're not being applied correctly, that someone is watching to make sure that they're not. And so, or if they're not. And so I think that this chief science advisor could be really involved in that moving forward. I mean, I do, I do hope that that's some of the steps that they're already taking, but I think it would be really nice to see it in the mandate. Um, I mean, I think COVID-19 provided a really good example of the importance of having strong scientific foresight in the government um, and sort of predicting what the next big scientific challenges are gonna be. And it's something that I think we generally need to do better on, but I think the science advisor could have a real role in this. Um, and then continuing to really just provide connections between departments, intramural, extramural, with our international partners, as well as just sort of reviewing and moving forward on how we do evidence-informed decision-making across all our departments of government. So these are just some of the high-level ways that I think that the, the office could be really integrated into a future of science advice in Canada. So sort of winding down, I also wanted to mention that, you know, while I've spoken today about federal science advice, we do have science advisors in other jurisdictions, and I think that it's becoming increasingly important to think about science advisors, not only sort of the federal level, but across other governments. These are provincial science advisors or people who play science advisory roles. So, um, you know, some of you may be familiar with Rémi Cuyon. Um, we have one in Alberta, that's Fred. Uh, in the Yukon, we have Ainsley, who's a senior science advisor. On the left here, I think it's important to sort of mention Molly Shoykit. So, um, this is an interesting example because the former Ontario Liberals actually implemented a chief scientist, which, you know, was a, a really cool move. And then Molly was put into place. But then when the, when the, uh, the government ended and there was an election and the Ontario Conservatives were voted in, they immediately fired her. And so because there was no, you know, requirement to have a science advisor or a, a chief scientist, they still haven't filled the position. And so, I mean, it's a really good example of how priority shifting can lead to changes in science advice. And I think that that's part of the reason why public support for science advice and having chief scientists is so important. Um, so, I mean, I think it's worth also mentioning, I've really highlighted a lot of the, the, the strong aspects of science advice, but of course there's always gonna be challenges and limitations of science advice as well. So, I mean, for example, having a single science advisor especially for something like a country as big as Canada, no one science advisor is going to be an expert in everything. And I think that this is part of the reason that I am so passionate personally about departmental science advice, because I mean, having not only, you know, a single science advisor, but also a very strong network of scientists and policy advisors and science advisors across the government is super important. Um, Evidence-based decision-making is also just really hard. So even when you have science advice, political de decision-making can still be challenging. Political decisions aren't always just going to be about science. Um, there's always going to be other factors to think about, like the economy, like the public, like you know, international relations, so many things. But I mean, I still think it's really important that having science at the table, at the political decision-making table, can really be an important aspect as well. Science can also move really quickly. It can come from lots of different sources. It can be challenging, especially when there's time limitations, capacity limitations. Um, and so, you know, we can't expect that a single science advisor is always going to have the right answers and be able to find them immediately. Um, this is also incredibly challenging in the face of misinformation and public trust. And I think we're seeing this, especially in the time of COVID. Um, and I mean, we saw just this week, last week, that some of our public health authorities were being threatened. And um, so, I mean, even when you have strong voices for science, that can be complicated as well. It's also important, too, that science advice remains nonpartisan and, you know, provides that external lens in a conversation. And these are all challenges. So I think it's just worth mentioning that even when you have science advisors, 
It doesn't mean that evidence-based decision-making is always gonna move perfectly. It's just meaning to sort of bolster and support evidence-informed decision-making um, by having a scientific voice at the table and adding to the landscape of science advice and helping to coordinate. Oops. Oops. So if you're interested in learning more, I mean, these are just two examples. So the International Network for Government Science Advisors, or INSA, is a really great resource if you're really interested in knowing what happens, what's happening in science advice around the world. Um, so you can see, um, you know, updates from science advisors in other countries. You can see there's lots of conferences. There's tons of resources. They have a really cool training program with case studies um, that you can use to sort of practice your science advice skills. Um, you can also check out the website of the Chief Science Advisor of Canada, which I checked is still there and the mandate is still up and, and running, which I'm relieved about, but um, that's where they post all of their sort of updates on what's going on in the federal government in science advice. So I'm going to leave it at that. Um, if you're interested in following up with us, I'm going to open up to questions right now, but um, I'll leave this here and keep it sort of on the screen for the rest of the presentation. But this is our website, so you can check out all of our resources. Um, we are e 4 dca um, on Twitter or Instagram, um, and we're on Facebook as well. You can send me an email directly if you're interested in chatting with me, or if you're interested in supporting our work, we also have a donation page, which um, we're supported by donors. So yeah, Emma's here now, which is awesome. So if you have questions, you can pop them in the chat box or in the Q&A box, and I'm happy to try my best to answer them. I will preface that I'm not a science advisor, nor am I an expert in science advice, um, but I'd be happy to, to have conversations about your thoughts. Yeah, so we don't have any questions just yet, but like Kim said, please feel free to pop them in the chat or the Q&A, and we'll be on for at least a few minutes if it takes you a second to think of your questions. So yeah. feel free to ask. Mm -hmm. Emma, do you have any questions? <laughs> I don't, but I do feel I learned some things. <laughs> Uh, we do have a question now. So um, how do the chief science advisor roles differ in other countries? It's a great question. That is a great question. And I actually don't, you know, I don't know enough about the individual mandates in other countries. But I mean, I can give an example just based on my knowledge of looking at Canada versus New Zealand. So New Zealand, I mean, it's a very different country than Canada. But um, but I know that the public, the public facing aspect of the New Zealand science advisor seems to be very different. So when I sort of look at what they have done in the past, from my perspective, the office has done a lot more sort of a report generation. So, you know, for example, I know one of the ones that I looked at when I was interested in this topic was there was a lot of public challenges around fluoridation. And so the office of the chief science advisor was actually tasked to go out and provide you know, a ton of research and actually, um, you know, put out a report to the government, but also to the public. Um, so whereas my perspective is that our chief science advisor is more sort of like supporting the internal decision making and less about actually providing more public reports, but it can really depend. Um, I also think a really interesting difference is whether or not there's like a broad network. So, I mean, I pitched the idea of departmental science advisors in the paper years ago and was really happy to see departmental science advisors, but like there hasn't really been a consistent way that departmental science advisors have been set up. So some countries have, you know, full-time positions for DSAs. Some of them are, you know, temporary people. Sometimes they're existing outside of the government. So science advisors are, are still housed in their substantive positions and they provide sort of temporary advice. So the model of science advice can look really different depending on where you are and what the role is. Um, great, so we have lots of questions coming in now. So up next we have, uh, what was the impact of the former chief science advisor? Right, so I mean, again, like I don't know all of the, the specifics that each of them did, but like I was saying before, it, it really has depended on what's happening in the government at the time. So some of the previous science advisors have, have worked more on sort of the economic side of science and science advice. So, you know, thinking about Canada's investments in science. Um, a lot of them have worked on sort of shaping Canada's science direction um, and sort of thinking about like where our next steps need to be. Some of them have worked in other places. So like, you know, National Research Council. So it's been more about research. 
Um, so it's really dependent on, on the political will. And I think that that's a really interesting thing to think about too, is that depending on, so while the position is not a partisan role, so it's not, you know, they're not a member of the, of the, the political party, um, sometimes the mandate of the office can be shaped by whatever the government is working on at that time. So I would expect that if the government did change, the mandate of the science advisor would also change and probably the background and the, and the role of the person would also change as well. So going off of that, we're getting a couple of questions about our next steps around the campaign. So uh, yeah. first we have, what would our next steps be if we don't get a response and if we don't see any announcements? And then similarly, do we have a campaign plan to follow up on the current mandate letter um, and is advocating and writing legislation part of what we do? Yeah, um, so that's a great question. So I, um, if you're interested in so, sort of still getting involved in the campaign, so we, my next steps internally are that I've reached out to not only the prime minister as well as the finance minister and the ISAD minister, but I've also done a lot of sort of internal government relation contacts to try and see if I can set up discussions with my key government contacts and do some sort of internal government relations. So what I would love to do is actually sit down with some of the, the public servants who are working for these key decision makers and some of our key stakeholders in government and bring to them you know, the open letter as well as a briefing note with some of our key asks and discuss with them about why we think that this is important. And I mean, sometimes that can be really effective. And I think that having the public support that we did on the campaign is really great. I mean, to have 2000 people in the midst of a pandemic saying we think science advice is really important and we want to grow it. I also think that it's great too, because we have made asks that are not financially restrictive. So I'm hoping that that can lead to some positive changes. And then in the meantime, if you're still interested in participating, although the mandate date end date is passed, we still have a tweet tool and an email to, um, to the key decision makers tool. So you can actually go onto our website on our campaign page and actually just enter in your information. It'll automatically tweet or email depending on what you prefer. So there's lots of ways that you can continue to get involved. Um, and then we do not write legislation, so we're not like a policy making body, but we do make policy recommendations pretty regularly. And so, I mean, part of the reason that I wrote in very clear mandate asks to in the open letter is because sometimes it can be great to actually provide clear language on what you want to see changed. Because when you're sort of working in an advocacy space like we do, having a clear problem that has a clear answer can be quite effective, I found in driving conversations. So, I mean, we're doing all we can do. I also will be engaging with members of the opposition parties because I think that this is a really important thing, not only to bring to the table for the government in power, but bring to the opposition as well. Um, next question I think will be good is, curious to hear your perspective on potential areas of focus that the CSA could take on over the coming years. So some examples being, uh, this person is specifically interested in improving knowledge and technology transfer, um, or examining risk associated with federal research funding models that don't prioritize public good research and related science activities. Yeah, I mean, the areas that I put forward are sort of the ones that I, I flagged. So, you know, that force and capacity, looking at, you know, continued S&T and COVID, looking at national coordination on science, but those are also really good examples. And I mean, I don't, it's a good question. I don't actually know how much the CSA interacts with the granting councils. I imagine that she does and that anyone would. Um, I mean, I think that it's a really interesting perspective to sort of like think about what the, the office could do. Um, I'm looking at the question again, just like reading it again. I really do like this sort of question about tech transfer. Um, I mean, I thought about this too. I didn't put it into the letter, but I mean, the office could be involved. I think that one of the things that I'm happy to see happening at the granting councils is um, a move towards trying to incentivize knowledge mobilization. Um, I don't remember what the policy is called. Someone maybe knows here, but um, but I know that there's there's like some discussion about trying to make outreach and knowledge mobilization more um, and more incentivized at universities. But I do think that you know, given the public aspect of the chief science advisor's work and that sort of diplomacy step, that could definitely be something that that I could see moving forward. Mm -hmm. Um, we're getting a couple of questions about legislation. So 
um, asking about, you know, how could we push further for legislation specifically? How important is that for, for maintaining the office through future governments? And then also my, my favorite is if the CSA was built into legislation, would it mean that e d would not be needed anymore? <laughs> I, <think. laughs> I mean, I hope not. <laughs> We're doing that. No. Um, okay, so that's a really good question. And I mean, right now, like if I'm being completely frank, I don't think that it would be beneficial to anybody to cut a position of a chief science advisor right now. Like I would say that, you know, looking at the landscape of science right now, I mean, I think that there is a public, it's a moment for public support for science because of the pandemic. Um, but I think that after the, after the Harper government, I think that it's a lot less sort of appealing to be anti-science. So I wouldn't expect necessarily that the role would be cut. But that said, we are entering into a really challenging financial time. And sometimes it's like, you know, difficult measures. And it could just say like, well, if, the, if this office isn't doing enough for the government or like, you know, if we just need to cut somewhere, we have an office that isn't legislated, we can cut it, right? And and so I think that that's why we think it's really important. It's also, you know, you never know what's going to change. Like it could be five years, 10 years from now. And if that office isn't protected, we've seen it decades over. You know, I gave examples of how the position has been cut and remade and cut and reshaped and cut. And so I think that the reason why we think legislation is so important is because it should be consistent and it should be a part of government regardless of what's happening, regardless of what priorities are and regardless of who it is. So, I mean, that's why I think it's important. No, and no, I don't think that we would continue to be, that we would stop being who we are. Like, I think that one of the strengths of E4D is that we constantly will hold the feet to the fire of anyone who's in power. And I mean, even if there is a science advisor in place, doesn't mean that decisions are always going to be made perfectly. And that's why I wanted to highlight some of the challenges around evidence-based decision-making, because, you know, there, there's always going to be challenges. And I mean, there's always things that I think that as the public and as supporters and advocates of science, we need to be constantly pushing for and ensuring that the best available science is being used and ensuring that the public is informed and, and asking for the next steps. So no, I think there's always the things we're going to need to be doing. I can think of a million things. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely agree. Um, <laughs> next question, switching gears just a little bit. Um, does the background of a science advisor significantly influence the advice they provide and in turn the decisions taken by the government? I think we'll start with that one. Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, I, I haven't seen data to suggest that. I don't know. Um, probably, probably. And I mean, I think I've thought about this a lot. And I mean, one of the challenges around having a science advisor is always going to be like, who is it, right? And and the process of going into choosing that is complicated. And I mean, they were appointed. But yeah, I, I would assume so. But this is also why I think, and I mean, I'm... I'm standing on my soapbox a little bit here, but that's also why I think that having a network of science advice is important and an office to support the science advisor. Because of course, like, you know, anyone who comes into a position is going to come in with all of their, their background knowledge, all of their connections, all of their experience and perspectives. So, I mean, in order to provide the most objective, the most informed advice, like any scientist, would be able to probably navigate the scientific literature and challenges, you know, relatively effectively, but having departmental science advisors or like subject matter experts to support them, I think is an important step. So my answer, I guess, short answer is, of course, I, I would say so. Um, so I'm just jumping around looking, we've got lots of questions still coming in. So another of my favorites is how can scientists and researchers engage with the science policy space? Ooh, great question. Yeah. This is what we do. <laughs> um, yeah, so lots of ways. So we have lots of tools in our training toolkit. So if you go to our training page at evidenceforDemocracy.ca, you can see that we have a lot of webinars and toolkits on everything from, you know, how does the budget process work and how do you engage with that budget process? How do you set up a meeting with your elected official? How does policy work in the first place? Just like Science Policy 101. So if you're interested in learning more about how policy works and how you can engage, I would recommend starting there. Um, because there's lots and lots of ways that you can engage in public processes and, and you know, things like that. I would say, you know, regularly touch base with your elected officials, you know, read the news, 
look at what's going on in process in policy processes, um, you know, speak up. And then there's also ways that you can sort of externally get involved, like writing op-eds, which um, we can also support you with. Or you, if you're interested in sort of sharing science, we have a webinar on writing briefing notes if you want to sort of bring something to the table. Yeah, lots of ways. But there's also a lot of like groups at universities as well. So if you're a student, um, the Toronto Science Policy Network, Science Policy Exchange, SPIN, the Science Policy Integration Network, they're all really great networks that you can get involved with to do some of that work at universities. Um, so kind of related to that question actually is uh, rather than having a singular science advisor or even a small committee, could it be more beneficial to hire a larger proportion of public servants with STEM backgrounds? I think about this all the time. <laughs> um, I mean, I think that both is good, right? I mean, it's a tricky question because I think that, you know, we, we don't want a technocracy where everybody who's in a decision making place is a scientist. I think that having people with diverse backgrounds in a public service is really important. But I agree that, you know, I think that a lot of scientists are now considering roles in the policy space. I mean, I'm one of them. My background is as a scientist and then I moved into the public service and worked as a policy analyst for years and then now I'm working here. Um, but it's not very common for a lot of people to work in the policy space. But it's interesting because as a person who's worked in a policy analyst job, there's a lot of similarities between policy analysis work and research. You know, you're looking into background information, you're synthesizing it into recommendations. It's a lot, it's a lot like lit review if you've worked in science. So yeah, I, I think that that would help a lot, especially in government departments. I mean, I think it's, it's also great to see, you know, an increase in ministers that actually have a background in what they do and really what the ministry does. So yeah, I would say that it's a little bit of both. But part of the, I mean, part of the strength of the public service is that it is really diverse. And I think having both is, is important. Um, so we've touched on this a little bit here and there, but this next question is, can you expand on what initiatives uh, can be in federal government or outside are the most effective for translating science into policy? Oh man, I don't know. <laughs> the most effective ways of translating science into policy, I mean, so there's there's a lot of like debate on what works best and i would say that it depends on what the issue is and it depends on you know what's going on so some of the ways in my experience that have worked well are effective science communication so you know not just putting science out there into the scientific literature and assuming that policy analysts and decision makers are always going to find it you know putting things into into forums and places where they can be accessed by government. So whether that means, you know, writing it in an op-ed, sending it as a briefing note to your government decision maker, you know, writing it in popular media and sharing things, putting it on blogs, um, getting science out there in ways that are accessible and like, written up in policy language. And I guess like sort of following up on that, ensuring that your, your problems and your policy solutions are clearly outlined. One of the biggest barriers in actually getting something onto the table of policymakers is not highlighting it in a way that the government would actually care about or be able to do anything about. Because if you just come with a problem saying, this is a huge issue, you need to think about it, but you don't have a, a reasonable policy solution, I mean, regardless of whether you're coming from outside of the government or you're working inside of the government, without a clear solution, you're not gonna get anywhere. Um, and sometimes it also means appealing to and understanding the needs of your decision maker. So having worked as a policymaker, and I'm sure that, you know, having a science advisor can really help with this, framing science in a way that's relevant and actually, you know, fits within an end goal of a current decision maker really helps. So, I mean, part of it is really just understanding the landscape and the context. And sometimes it can even just come down to timing, you know, putting things on the table at the right time. And, and sometimes it's also about drumming up public support. So, I mean, it would be a very long discussion if I went into all of it, but, um, you know, sometimes, sometimes it's about, you know, do you take an internal approach and sort of have those conversations or do you drum up a lot of noise and public support for science? That can also be another way. I think a good follow-up that we have here is how does the Office of the CSA play a role in science communication as well? Yeah, you know, if I had like 
a bit of criticism, I would say that this is something that I would love to see more of. I mean, the office does a lot of public facing stuff, of course, and like all of their reports are accessible, but, and they, they do have like a Twitter account. Um, but I would say that like, I would like to see more from the office in terms of, you know, outreach to the public and helping the public navigate challenging science. Um, it's, it's not necessarily the, in the mandate of our current science advisor, but I would like to, I would like to see more sort of public facing mm -hmm. tools for science for the public, especially trying to sort of navigate things like misinformation. Um, Cause I think that that could be a really interesting next step of the office as well. Um, another great question we have is what are the different roles of the provincial and federal science advisors and how do they work together uh, in the larger science policy landscape? That's a good question. I actually don't know. Um, I don't know a ton about what the individual provincial science advisors are doing. Um, I think it's different really within, within each province. Um, I mean, I know like Quebec, the, Remy has been the, the, science, the chief scientist there for a long time and he has a, quite a prominent role in the sort of public space, whereas other science advisors at the provincial level, I don't think do, but I could be wrong. So, I mean, I don't wanna try and expand on something that I don't know a lot about. And I, I actually don't know how the, the federal science advisor integrates with the provincial science advisors. It's a good question. Yeah, I'm curious now. <laughs> yeah. um, another good question here is how are science advisors selected by governments? What's the process? How transparent is it? And what factors do they take into account? Um, and do we see any notable flaws in the process? Yeah, I mean, it was an appointment process. So you could apply. Uh, I'd have to go back and like look at it again, but I know there was a call. Um, and I, I believe that that has been the way that it has been for departmental science advisors as well. So I, I mean, in terms of how transparent it, it is, I, I think it's kind of like an internal hiring process. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what the criteria were, how it actually went. There was a public call. Um, yeah, it was a long time ago. I have to go back and look, but yeah, it was an internal process from what I remember. <laughs> Um, so I think we probably have time just for another one or two questions. I'll start with a quick one. Uh, does e work with the Canadian Science Policy Center? Yeah, good question. I mean, yeah, <laughs> we do. <laughs> um, so we, we participate in the Canadian Science Policy Center conference every year. So I think we've had a panel for the last like five years, at least one. So, I mean, we, we actively participate in the conference. We've done some writing for the CSPC. Um, yeah, we're definitely a friend of CSBC. If you haven't ever checked out the conference, I would strongly recommend, and they also have some great resources on their, their website as well. Um, so another question here, I'm not sure whether they're referring to uh, the Ontario Chief Scientist or the federal CSA, but they're asking any official reason explaining why no new CSA was nominated? Good question. Okay, so I can answer both, both provincial and federal. Um, at the federal level, I don't know. Like, I mean, my guess is just that, um, you know, they could, they could have ended the mandate and implement, put in a new call. But I just, if I had to guess, I would say that they just didn't feel the need to. Um, you know, the, the liberals were the ones who implemented this, this chief science advisor. They were the ones that hired her. So my guess is that they just decided to sort of renew the mandate because the office was working well and um, they trusted the the setup, so that would be my guess. They didn't make an, a public announcement about it, to my knowledge, so that would be my guess. Mm -hmm. um, and then at the, the provincial level, I actually looked into this a lot. So last year, I think you can probably still find it on our blog, I put in a, a request for access to information on anything I could find about whether or not the Ontario government was looking to hire a new chief scientist and could find nothing, which to me indicated that they weren't actively looking. Although it's possible now that they might shift given the fact that COVID has happened and um, a lot has changed. And so, I mean, it might be a good time for us to sort of keep pushing for an Ontario chief scientist, but there was no clear indication why they didn't put it into place, except that they just had no indication to do it at the time. That was at least what I could hear from every channel I tried. Um, so we just have one minute left. I'll ask just one more quick question. I think we'll have to leave it there then. Um, so this last one is, should the term of a CSA be limited to a certain number of years, like the Governor General, or should it be extended for however long a government sees fit? 
That's a really tough question. And I don't know if I have a good answer because I mean, I can see reasons for both, you know, I can see wanting to have it be a short, uh, you know, a limited term to bring new life to the position, but I can also see it being, you know, having benefits to having the same person in the position, especially if the government stays the same because you have trusted relationships, you have, you know, knowledge that gets built up, especially because, you know, a lot of the time chief scientists are brought in who are coming from outside government, who might have to learn the ropes of government. So I'm not sure if I have a real clear perspective on that. I could see benefits of both. Okay, so it is one o'clock. I'm just gonna uh, quickly answer one more question because we touched on it before, but someone is asking for resources on the relationship between science and policy, and you can find those on our website, particularly on our training page. So I would definitely recommend that you all head there after, and we can also include some links in the follow-up email that you'll get as well. Yeah. And uh, thanks so much for all your questions. I'm sorry I couldn't get to all of them. It's, uh, it's good. I'm, it's nice to see so much engagement. But if you have burning questions that you didn't get answered, you, you can feel free to email us and we'll do our best to answer them. Um, and yeah, thank you so much for tuning in.